Good morning. This is Dr. Sharon Upper with Alive and Kicking with my dear colleague Susan Quinn. Good morning. Hi, Sharon. Today we have with us exciting Dr. Sandra Barrett. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, Sharon. Susan, good to be here. So we are, you know, kicking off the after show after we've just had a very interesting interview with Sandra about her new book. <clears throat> The Secret of Your Cells. I, I want to go over some of the material that they may not have heard on the NPR show yet, Sandra. So I know this book is um, kind of a, a, new, a whole new way of looking at cells that, you know, as a scientist, you look at cells from a very kind of biochemical way, but you also take the perspective of looking at cells in a more sacred, energetic way. Can you explain to the audience what really, what's the sacred perspective of cells? Well, I think part of it is looking at how did I even get from being a mainstream scientist to seeing liquid in the cells. And as you can see in the background is the microscope. So for me, the first shift of my awareness about cells was seeing living human cells under the microscope. Mm -hmm. I was astounded at what they could do. And at that point, I think before that, I was an agnostic and began seeing there has to be a God once I look at the cells. And because the research I was doing when I was at the University of California was in children's cancers and children's leukemia, it was their cells I began looking at and began doing slideshows for kids on vitamins and minerals, everything I could photograph underneath that microscope. By the way, I need a new microscope if anybody is listening and has an interference microscope at their disposal. I need one. Um, this one died after 40 years. Uh, the same month that the book came out, which is kind of interesting. Mm. <laughs> so, so working with the kids, I had to get into concepts that, as a scientist, I never thought about life and death, really, and started working with a shaman when, uh, who I didn't know was a shaman, I, he was a clinical psychologist, when one of my little friends uh, was close to death and I had no idea how to deal with that. Um, and I called him up. He had been a, a visiting those of us who were doing alternative work with, with the kids at that point, even though I was just doing my lab research on the 12th floor. Um, I hung out with the kids. And um, he told me not to deal to feel. And when I went in to meet with him about, well, how do I feel about not, you know, death and dying, um, I saw that he was a shaman. And I started working with him. This is in the late 70s, so it's a long time ago. I started working with him and really got an appreciation of other ways of knowing, um, using the imagination, seeing symbols everywhere, and uh, began seeing the... First, it was the art in our cells and how beautiful they were. Uh, and then I began you know, looking at correspondences between sacred traditions and what our cells did. And it, it's been, it was a struggle as a scientist to even admit that cells had a sacred nature or they could be our teachers. Uh, can we, can we back up on that? I'm so sorry sure. to interrupt you. I just can we just back up a minute and could you explain when you use terms like cellular intelligence, like what you really mean by that? Because I think it'd be interesting for people to really get an understanding when you're talking about cells in this way. Okay, cellular intelligence. Well, first of all, if you think about what cells have to do, if we had to do it, they have to make all the proteins in the body. They have to read the codes. They have to make all the energy they need to live throughout the day and more. They have to be able to uh, detect uh, dangerous invaders. So they have an intelligence that we could never figure out all of that. So that's one level of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the other is understanding that, well, we not only is the intelligence of what they can do and intelligence we have in our brains or minds, there's a, actually an anatomical place in our cells. The, fab, the cells have a fabric. Your listeners may, watchers, may be aware of protoplasm or cytoplasm when we learned about biology. But there's a netting in that protoplasm or in that, the inside of the cell, 
and that is what is the decision maker. So have you know recept receiving sites antenna on the outside of the cell that takes in information if we're stressed. Uh, the cells can receive that those molecules of information, but the inside of the cell has to decide what to do. And for me, what's exciting about, okay, now we have this anatomy that is the responder. It regulates whether the cell divides, which genes are expressed, uh, what sha how the cells change shape. But from a per per perspective of practicality, uh, these are things, and we can tune into our cellular intelligence. We can access it through movement, through cellular, you know, yoga. We could call it cellular yoga. We can access it through sound. Anything that's going to cause these strings to vibrate, if you will, and, and mm. change shape influences their intelligence. I don't know so if that's clear right. or not. I'm just curious, do different cells from different parts of the body have different kinds of intelligence? Like, do you expect something different from a cell that's in your heart versus your skin or some at a different level? Can you talk about that a bit? Well, they have different abilities. So cells have different abilities. They all have the same genes, but a heart cell is going to be able to do different things than a skin cell. And so from that perspective of different intelligences, yeah, they do have different abilities. They have different energy as well. If I, you know, the, heart, the heart's a very special organ in the body. Many traditions, like the Native Americans, will talk about think with your heart. Uh, in the Chinese language, the word for mind and heart are the same. So if we really resonate with I can feel my heart, I can hear my heart, um, I can experience gratitude, and all my cells are going to get into that same state together. So it's a, the, some cells have more power uh, to change our whole body than, than others. So you talk about openness in the book, about being open consciously and also the cells being open. Can you explain a little bit about that, too? Oh, well, I think when I'm talking about openness, I'm talking about do we listen or are we always reacting? So my experience in the past, and I still do it uh, at times, is I'm not always open to what other people are telling without judgment. So I go into reaction, as many of us do. My mind will go into reaction. So how do we remember just be open and listen rather than reactive. Again, I always go back to my cells because it makes it, you know, I think about, well, the cells are always in the now. Am I going to feed them with some kind of reactive, closed-minded uh, information, or am I going to be open to any kind of possibility of just listening to somebody? Why, why do you think that that's, uh, that's the, uh, I think that's true for humankind in general and not so true for the cells? Mm -hmm. And how, how, why do you think that is, that, that people are prone to being that way and have to really consciously try to listen and be open? Well, we have mind, we have ego, we have this overlay of we haven't paid attention to our most basic self, which is from my perspective, is the cellular self. And we're trained to react, you know, as kids, we're trained to react. Uh, we're told, don't do this, don't think that. I mean, I, I know there were times when my mom would talk to me and I would, in my mind, think she's not saying the words <laughs> that she means. She really is angry at me, but she's saying words that she's uh, being loving. And I knew I would feel something different, which as children, we probably pretty sensitive to that. We learn to turn it off. We mm -hmm. turn off that intuition because we, I certainly did because I didn't trust it. So I, I think, think one, the mind is, yeah. No, I was going to say, I think one of the first times um, people often hear about this notion of your body being an important receptor of 
things that you see and feel. It's like when you're pregnant, you know, people talk about, like, oh, I don't want to go to a scary movie because I don't want the baby to get scared. You know, there is that. I mean, that's like, I think, one of the only times that I can remember people having a recognition that what you eat and what you think mm. and what your response to has an effect on your cells on, and again having to do with an unborn child. So I think there is something out there in the universe where people do have an understanding of this notion that there's some kind effect. of effect of your body and what you're, you know, what you're around, what your perspective is, what you're feeling if you're scared or angry or happy. Um, so I think it's like this is almost like a springboard to that little bit of, you know, acknowledgement that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. I mean, an easy thing to think about, I mean, sometimes the invisible, you know, what we think uh, seems to not affect our body. Mind body mm -hmm. was a split for lots of years. Uh, you know, but you can, if you think a, an erotic thought or think about a scare or go to a scary movie, you feel your body change. So I think, I mean, it's a blessing that past decade, at least, people are starting to think about, oh, how the mind and body are connected and what we do influences our health and well-being. I want to shift More gears a minute. Can, yeah. I want to shift gears a minute because, you know, we are here at Toot Sweet where we have, and in the Napa Valley where there's so much, um, energy and talk and thoughts and tastes around wine. And I know as a photographer, you've um, written this beautiful book about wine. And I, I know that, Susan, you... Um, oh, yeah. I, I was very curious about this. Uh, so you started out, I wanted to also ask you a little bit about your, your past and your history and what, what brought you with these two uh, intersections of, uh, I think you started out taking photographs of leukemia cells and... Um, looking at the molecular structures of them, and that brought you into, I'd love to hear, how did that bring you into taking photographs of the molecular, molecular structures of wine? <laughs> oh, great question. And I will show you the book. <laughs> it's oh, basically you. sold out. Uh, it's, uh, basically sold out. We're looking for a second edition. We're doing a second edition. Um, and how I got into it, as I mentioned earlier, I was photographing cells, and then I was photographing the molecules of life to show kids uh, how their bodies worked. And at that time, I was struggling. Did I want to be an artist or a scientist? And a friend set me up with an uh, appointment up at Sterling Vineyards, which at that time, this is in the 80s, they had an artist residence program. And so I decided I better photograph my first wine for this uh, interview. I photographed a 1978 Merlot and I never looked at a wine. And the winemaker said, oh, it looks like it tastes. And I thought that was phenomenal because I had no words for wine. And uh, I had a two-year basically apprenticeship to develop the show with with uh, Theo Rosenbrand and Bill Dyer was the assistant winemaker, and they would ask questions about winemaking. What did a wine look different if it came from Diamond Mountain versus down in the valley? And so I started photographing everything. Oh. And one of the things that really came out was the molecules related to taste, like sweet and sour and bitter. Uh, what would you think that sweet would taste like? The shape of sweet. Any what idea? Would it look like? uh, if you had a ge geometric no. <laughs> shape of sweet. Oh, okay. So sweet is more rounded, sugar is more I rounded. Say round. <laughs> Me too. I was going to say that. Um, I don't know why. Yeah. Sour, the sour acids are all angular. Uh, prickly, you know, caffeine is prickly. So it became really interesting to me that, yeah. ah, these molecular shapes through the microscope tell a story about how we experience wine. Mm. And we have to get I, it down here. You have to come down with yeah. your book and we have to get some wine. Uh, out. We have to just take I, it. Yeah, there you go. I know. Absolutely. Uh, Let, before we let you go, I know that you uh, had some experience with Andre Telechef, and how did you yes. meet? And can you tell us a little story about Andre? Okay, the, the first time I met Andre was <laughs> uh, at uh, the old Inglenook, 
And the old Ingle Nook had hired me to photograph 40 years of their Cabernets. They had done this. They were doing this special event for a uh, spectator. Turns out, uh, so I'm in the corner taking my little samples. Turns out the wine spectator put the wrong date in their book, and now there was space for me to participate in the tasting and the food and everything that goes with opening four precious bottles from 1941 on. And uh, they sat me next to Andre. And so that was my first experience. He would talk to me about you know, what he saw in the wines. And then uh, I had done a, a show, I guess this was, no, it was maybe even before that, a show uh, for wine industry. And uh, a grape grower in uh, Pope Valley made a special dinner because she said, what are you seeing? (laughs) I I don't know. I'm seeing all these pretty pictures and wine. So she's made a special dinner for Andre and his wife and um, a couple of other winemakers. And we met in San Francisco. And she asked him, what was I, you know, what do you think (laughs) Sandra's showing under the microscope? And he says, she's showing the jewels in wine. They should be mm-hmm. on silk scarves and jewelry. <laughs> the <laughs> like, jewels okay, and wine. That, oh, that, that's great. Yeah, the jewels and wine. Yeah, so there are lots of jewels and wine. Most of them have some kind of uh, jewelry artistic expression. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's why I need a new microscope. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. we got to get Sandra a new microscope. Well, Sandra, thank you so much for being with us today on Too Sweet, Alive, and Kicking. Um, and we look forward to getting you back down here to talk about wine again. Yeah. You know, and so oh, I'd book, love to. About yourself, that's something that we really all should be reading about, getting more understanding of. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was fun. Bye-bye.